here in the perimeter, there are no stars. Out here, we is stoned, immaculate. Hello and welcome. This is the C86 Show. I'm David Eastall. As you know, we love a special guest. This week is going to be the turn of the American LA bass band. It is medicine, because I recently spoke to Brad Lena to find out more about life, love, poetry and all the other groovy stuff. So this is the interview, which um, is going to be exciting. So do take notes. I will test you at the end to make sure that you have been paying attention. But anyway, it's a great chat. Well, I think so. So, um, yes, sit back, relax and enjoy. So after several minutes of casual chat, we got down to that very exciting subject that was the early formative years. I know it's a classic, isn't it? Anyway, Brad, take it away. Well, yeah, and it's the typical thing. It's the Beatles. I mean, I, it's so boring to say, but, you know, I grew up in a house full of Beatles LPs and was transfixed immediately. I mean, I, you know, shocker, yes. you know. I mean, um, my dad had the first Credence album and uh, Cheap Thrills by Janis Joplin and stuff like that. But, you know, the, the, that, uh, the Beatles. those darn Beatles. Yes. Well, yeah, it's I mean, interesting it's, because because the day I saw there was a post saying it was on this is the anniversary of John and Paul meeting, and so the all right. the universe was never going to be the same again since you know, no. since that moment in 1950 something was you know this is the day that they met. So um, there you go. It's a massive yeah, moment. Beautiful. It is. A big it is. I mean, I, no, that's a. I love the story and I the whole mythology and it. It's just you know. I'm into all of it. It's it's ridiculous. Total total nerd about it. So how did you cope watching the Disney Eight Hour Special on um, the Beatles making uh, their last album together? I ate it like a massive feast. I mean, and it, I in some ways it inspired the New Medicine album because Jim and I both were just you know watching it in tears. You know, just just completely moved. I, it, it's 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 quite a tremendous thing i'm ready to sit through the whole damn thing again yes were you surprised by the way uh by what well the, you know the, the the narrative the story the fact that you know after their initial kind of having a few moments with especially with george that the band just seemed to get on better and better to be so yeah, comfortable it, and it and so very... p- pleasant to each other and so nice yeah the incredibly british right like no <laughs> no uh <laughs> confrontation really no um, was... but uh, yeah i very joyful i mean it's you know the the first episode when john is strung out is a little hard to take um i found that pretty dark um but then i think they they switched to amphetamines after that and it's just it's all it's all fun and games for the last with tea with tea tea and biscuits and um, right there is a moment you got to watch it with subtitles because there is a a moment at the end of the first episode where they say, Mal, do you, you know, do you have any of those pills? Right. I didn't catch that. I think that yeah, you there gotta was watch a... subtitles are totally necessary. Right. I felt the moment where John and Paul were having the chat and they've, they've mic'd the flower you know, the, this yes. sort of flowers that must've been for Paul. That must be very strange here in that conversation. It's yeah, it's pretty intense stuff. I mean, I, but I love how it's just them in a room being, themselves despite being i I guess in the eye of the hurricane i I think i heard a quote from john saying it was calm in the eye of the hurricane Um, it was very calm i mean it was just surprisingly relaxed i kind of i mean i know it's slightly obsessed with this film though but i was same here same here it it was it was kind of it was a bit scooby-doo because we always had this kind of we knew the narrative wasn't quite right that yoko broke up the band but when it kind of the mask came off it was the kind of the manager, the the potential. I don't think any of it would have happened without Yoko. I mean, no, so, she had to sit fan, through all big, that. Yeah, um, I mean, right? That's love, right? Hearing <laughs> having them to sit around listening to them half play ten million songs. But I mean, a lot of that is just. I mean, as a Cal- Jim and I were saying, as Californians, we were thrilled to see them do uh, uh, "Going Up the Country" by Canned Heat, who are you know a local band for us. So. You know, I was like, wow, the Beatles are doing canned heat. You know what yes. I mean? Like that, that's uh, it's just, you know, we, we were proud. We, well, I'm not surprised. And I thought Paul, who kept it going at times, did very well 
when Yoko was screaming a lot, I thought that was quite, you know, I would have. I, 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 he was into it. I, he was into it. I, I, my takeaway from that was he should have been in the fucking Plastic Ono band, you know? <laughs> why the hell wasn't he? You know, why couldn't the Beatles just transform into the Plastic Ono band? You know, I, it could, I think they could have stayed together if Paul had been willing to to stick his neck out artistically because I mean, you know, this is Paul was hanging out with William Burroughs and jamming with AMM and stuff like that. He wasn't a stranger to avant-garde. No, stuff. he he was I the mean, one who, who sort of embraced the sixties counterculture more than John did really. Right. John was suburban and, you know, on acid and, and, way and much more little. cynical. He didn't really go for it. Right. Like, um, and, but Paul really bought into that world of, there was a guy called Barry Miles and the international times yes. crew. And he really yes. loved all that kind of stuff. So, um, in a yeah. way, he, he he took he took that on board much more than John did, I think. And um, right. So, you know, what if that's that was my big what if is like, look at how joyful Paul is when they're jamming with with Yoko. I mean, and then the and the then drums. then the keyboard player comes in, which is just joyful. And that guy, they all yeah, love yeah, this guy, Billy. Didn't they? Billy Preston. It was just yeah. like, they loved him. It's, they wor- worshipped him. <laughs> It's just you know to to see it all come together, and that's the my takeaway from hearing uh, in progress recordings of the Beatles is how they always ended up making the right choices and had so many choices to make along the way to get there. As an artist, did you find that quite amazing when they were trying to sort of think, right, we've got a few more records, we've got a few more tracks on the album. And then Glenn John says, you know, what's that song about the long road that you was playing? And you think, my God, you know, that's one of the greatest, you know, most, you know, famous songs of all in popular music. And Right. And it's and just that, a casual conversation. It's like, oh, yeah, let's have a go at that one. And shall, yeah, we, shall, we, shall we finish it now? You know, is yeah, it any good? It's, fantastic it's all just great so did it did it did it inspire you then to think god i really want to get back and do some music i suppose so um i've said elsewhere that you know this record happened because jim all of a sudden kind of mapped out an entire album on the drums and came over here and insisted i record them and it was so inspiring that that is what happened i mean he kind of made it happen by a force of will um and drums so um yes you know just it's something as simple as that really i mean and but yeah g- definitely got me thinking about you know songs again yes which, you know it's been a been a been a while so it's um, been a while so as you were as you were growing up then during the sort of the 70s period did you have older brothers and sisters who kind of influenced you or your parents particularly parents. influential Parents. I'm the oldest of two siblings. So, but I had a lot of older friends who were super cool. But my, you know, my dad had great taste in music. He was even into punk rock. I mean, he was a huge, like, Stiff Records fan, Elvis Costello, Nick Lowe, uh, Ian Dury kind of thing. And, and total, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, like obsessed with British culture, you know? Right. Like, uh, he had uh, my parents like took a vacation to England in '76, and they told me that they saw they crossed paths with the Ramones coming there for the first time. It was '76 or '77, whenever the first year that the Ramones went there. Nice. My dad came back saying, "Oh yeah, you know, we saw this group." I mean, it's it's crazy, but uh, yeah, he's he's passed on, but um, you know, he had it. it yeah, he kind of. I mean, he was a he wasn't a musician. He just loved music. And I think got a kick out of me becoming a musician. Yes. There's a great film that came out last two years ago, probably. Um, King Rocker about Robert Lloyd and the Nightingales. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's it's no. kind of narrated by Stuart Lee. So if, you, if you're interested in a great... Those are, I mean, I, I only vaguely know what you're talking about. So I will check that out. It yes, awesome, King right? Rocker, the story of the Nightingales with Robert Lloyd. Anyway, the point about that, there's a very good... It's a fantastic film and you'll love it to pieces. Right. It's, it's up there, not quite with the Beatles. But there's a lovely <laughs> bit where um, he, Robert, basically living on 
the back of well just living rough a bit you know getting the band together and he goes down to see the Ramones and he and he's quite keen on the band he's really keen on the band and Danny Fields is there as well and there's some really amazing photographs of that very first concert or first tour that the Ramones did in London with wow. Robert Lo- a young Robert Lloyd from the Nightingales and Danny Fields the famous Danny Fields who um right. has that great film um, which came out on Netflix called Danny Says Danny Rob- Says Yes. Yeah. Have you seen it? I think I have. Yeah, it was a while back though. It's been it's a, a good. It's a cool. So is it, so what how did you kind of cuz I was basically somebody who was obsessed with music but I never got into a band. So how did you navigate into that next kind of phase of life? You mean playing? Yes, playing. I picked it up at a really early age. Uh started with, you know, I learned guitar, folk guitar chords from both of my parents who came up at a time where you, you know, socially had to know a few chords on the guitar uh early 60s so that and got a piano and i taught myself to play like elton john style just chords playing banging chords out i couldn't read music but i could play like elton john for some reason um and just you know i was so transfixed by those recordings that i absolutely had to know how to do all that so i spent my you know entire from early childhood on uh, learning to play and putting ad hoc bands together and from a very early age i mean i you know i ended up playing bass in a group on television in 1979 uh uh it was a, a an, an american tv show called kids or people too <laughs> in case you didn't know that they were um and we uh were we played with the captain and Tennille. god <laughs> like, that's your I mean, rock and that right and that was like 79 and i i'm sorry everybody who knows me hears this story but apparently okay so tony Tennille of the captain and Tennille, she was also a professional backing vocalist uh she had a group with carl wilson from the beach boys that was specifically for doing session backing vocals and she told a story 20 years later that they went to uh go record with pink floyd who were in los angeles recording the wall and this show that I had played on with the Captain Tennille had just been broadcast and she walks into the studio and David Gilmore says to her, Oh, I just saw you on TV playing with those kids. <laughs> so, you know, which is, if I had only known that story when I was little, it would have blown my mind. Cause I, I saw, <laughs> I saw Pink Floyd play the wall a year later in 1980, but you know, that's the first thing Gilmore says to her, like, you know, so I joke that I influenced the wall because yes. you saw it. <laughs> Absolutely. That was, that was it really. I'm just gonna, it's I'm a re- re- ridiculous story. Sorry. But. So were these your kind of avant-garde improv bands like Debt to Nature and, and Steaming Coils? Yeah, those were, well, later. I mean, Debt of Nature, I started when I was 14, Steaming Coils shortly thereafter. So yeah, I was, you know, I had a neighbor hand me, uh, Yoko Ono, Plastic Ono Band, and and uh, Life with the Lions, Unfinished Music, when I was like 10. And I was like, wait a minute, you can do Beatle music and this kind of stuff too? You know, and so, <laughs> you know, thanks, you know, ruined my life forever, you know. So yeah, I was like investigating feedback and tape manipulation and things like that. Anything I can get my hands on, uh, playing with radios and stuff from a really early age, as well as loving the pop music you know so because at that stage because i mean it's a bit i mean to be honest i i was kind of influenced by by my older brother who was seven years older who right who who was kind of the prog kind of he loved prog yes. you know, he loved the yes genesis wishbone ash box james harvest the solo work of rick wakeman amazing and then same, same. and then you know there was deep purple black sabbath and that was kind of him he never had a seven inch single it was just albums in those right. plastic sleeves i mustn't touch them and obviously as soon as he left the house you know you'd go and you'd play them <laughs> but he did have them. he has yes, i know, didn't touch my records <laughs> and then he had two albums which you know like in the probably early mid 70s yeah probably 74 70, he had you know Goodbye, Yellow Brick Road and Sergeant Pepper, which yes. at the time we had no cultural context. It was just like, and I was obsessed with these two records. And say that Goodbye, Yellow Brick Road was huge for me when I was at that time too. Yeah. And and you know the last song on side four, Harmony, I, I just think is just one of the most. Perfect. I couldn't couldn't agree more. I've did, I covered it once actually. Did you? Yes, it yes. was just. 
and right. you know there was like yeah no that's the one you and i agree on that and also that's, with that's um, a tremendous song yes it is you know lyrically and, and emotionally <laughs> right. i think i think i i embraced romantic melancholia at a young age because my mum used to have radio two on which was kind of soft pop but it had a lot of stuff like the carpenters and but back rack yes. i realized the carpenters were all jo- singing about really sad lonely yes. things so years yes. later then when i got into joy division and the smiths i thought oh yeah of course you know karen carpenter has been singing about loneliness and loveless relationships all you her life got it i couldn't agree more I so couldn't agree more. That, that kind of just, uh, you know, bathing in melancholy. Yes. I say goodbye to love. No one seems to care if I should live or die. That could have been yeah. Ian Curtis, you know. Abs- I, yeah, no argument for me. I, you know, it, I'm, you know, I, I, it's hard to top Karen Carpenter. Really. It is hard, even on, and on drums. I mean, God, have you seen her go for it? My God. Yes, fantastic musician. I just, you know. She should have joined a punk band, uh, really, and got rid tra- of it. Tragic, so tragic. Her and Judy Sill both just bring me to bring yes. me tears. You know? Stunning, stunning. But in this country, we had, you know, very simplistically, the punk period, which is good for about 18 months, and then it's a bit sad. And then you had the post-punk world of Gang of Four and Magazine and you know, public, pu- yes, yeah. public Image, which was <laughs> obviously a good one. And there's, oh, um, yeah. and there's a good new book out on John... McGeoch has just kind of been right. published, which um, obviously we all love. Though the work he did with Peel wasn't great, but the work he did with Susie and the right. magazine were amazing. Yeah, Peel, <clears throat> but, Peel stops, stops for me at Flowers of Romance. Yeah, that. definitely. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it gets even more embarrassing, doesn't it? Um, yeah. But then, but but then, you know, in this country, you know, there was the introduction of kind of, I suppose, electronic music, and then there was new romantics. But for me, eighty three was the year of the Smiths, and that has this massive influence. I mean, what sure. was, and in this country as well, you know, we have Thatcher seventy nine, then we have the Falkland War, then we have the Miner Strike, Greenham Common, you know. So the, yeah. very quickly, you know, there's a lot of that kind of poverty and the Tory party, the great Tories, yes. um, and, you know, the, 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 the loads of money and everyone's very excited about the stock exchange. But on the other side, everyone's just claiming unemployment and scraping yes. by. So that landscape in the UK was quite interesting. What was it like for you in America and in LA at this stage? I, I mean, there, I think there are parallels. I mean, there was a lot of, uh, uh, you know, Reagan uh, is a parallel to, to you know, Thatcher, obviously. I mean, I, I, there's a, a lot of, you know, nuclear angst, you know, thinking that, you know, we could all be blown up at any moment. So I, I, I mean, I visited London in 84. So I have a, a, a like a physical sense of, of that, of, of that, what it was like, I guess a little bit, but you know, uh, it was the same here, but with sunshine, I guess, yes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I know, Angst that's, in the sun. <laughs> that's that's quite nice. So how and did I was you? Seeing, I was seeing a lot of those bands when they came through here. Gang of Four was huge for me. I mean, I, you know, I was really keyed into all that. And what about people like Bad Brains and um, the kind yeah, of hardcore punk, scene? Punk rock, punk rock was was wonderful before it became too boneheaded. I loved Black Flag and the Circle Jerks and 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 uh, Dead Kennedys and Bad Brains, as you say. And you know, I mean. That stuff was great before it became sort of, you know, boneheaded, just, you know, rock and roll. Yes. Uh, Blokes uh, blokes with issues. Yes, many, many issues. So, um, you know, as long as it was sort of, uh, you know, acid damaged and and sort of post-hippie, which I think is what punk really is. It's just, you know, the hippies a couple years on or they're the hippies younger siblings or something. Yes. As long as there was some connection there, I, I liked it. I, I think it, once it became more sort of heavy metal, you know. That said, Jim Goodall, our drummer, his favorite band is Venom. So, which, <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't get that. But I mean, when I heard them at the time, I was like, oh, it's a metal band that's been listening to Black Flag. That's interesting, you know. Yes, it's weird, isn't it? Really, bands like that. I don't. Um, I mean, yeah, I love not my thing either. But you know, I mean, I do get Motorhead. I loved Motorhead. I thought they sure. just even you know into their their latter period and their last album they did was i think they they got an amazing sound and yeah and lemmy had you know amazing integrity 
Amazing. Right. I, you know, and he was in Hawkwind. So, you know. He was. He was the man, wasn't he? <laughs> and um, I know. God, what a band. But then how right. did you navigate the 80s? Because you were, again, doing lots of experimental music. So did you leave school, college at 16 or did you stay on and do music as a as No, a I, I would have wanted to study music, but I uh, didn't have the financial backing to do that. It was considered uh, impractical, strangely enough. So, no, I left uh, school at 18 and spent most of the 80s wishing it was the 60s or 70s and completely denying most 80s culture, most, you know, Lindrum um, sample heavy stuff. And I listened to it, got really involved in, 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 you know, there's actually a lot of great experimental and progressive stuff from the 80s. I got really into like recommended records, you know, the post, the uh, post Henry Cow crap. Right. Um, this heat um it was really oh, really into this heat really into throbbing gristle you know uh, stuff like that you know the the really extreme end of post punk that where it met sort of progressive um you know there's great european progressive stuff a band called etron fool et Lublin. um i mean i could go on and on about yeah that stuff. did you I get mean, into the sound this band the band, the sound. I've heard. I, you know, I didn't. I know the name, um, but never, never did. I was. It was more. Um, this heat. This yeah, heat. that kind of crowd. The work. <laughs> you yes. ever hear the work? <laughs> no, but this heat. I did because I, I, I did an interview with the drummer with this heat. And oh yeah, Charles Hayward. I mean, yes. you know. Who's still great. doing it? He, he, One of the yeah. Great. So was it the case? Because I kind of can relate to that. What they're always kind of vaguely thinking, oh, it would have been great to have been born in a different decade when it was this. Yeah. But, but do you was that kind of did you sort of slowly move out of that and think, no, I need to be in the moment? Yes. And that's kind of where medicine happened, really. Where I finally, yes. you know, um would in the late 80s, early 90s. Because in, uh, in the UK, I mean, I suppose, again, I love my simplistic musical moment, but the, right. the, the kind of the Smiths had that five year period, sort of 83 to 87. So indie pop was really exciting. Um, right. And there was, you know, we were obsessed with John Peel. So John Peel, anything he played from the Bundy Boys to Gregory Isaac to yeah. Extreme Noise, Der Terror, you know, you just kind of thought, God, John, you know, you just trusted this guy. Like, right. You, you know, and if he thought, played you, then you made it. So when he, you know. I, yes. It's one of my greatest regrets in life that he invited Medicine to do a session and we couldn't from for scheduling reasons. Oh, ugh, that's so ugh. close, wasn't it? Terrible, but in the terrible. UK, we also, it's a tiny country, isn't it? You could fit it in your pocket. And so with a lot of bands, you know, there were the gatekeepers, you know, the John Peel, the Janice Long, um, you know, was, there was a few other DJs like sure. Kid Jensen. But also we had three weekly music papers, Sounds, Melody Maker and NME, which, oh, you know, know. Which, which gave, you know, like a circulation of some ridiculous amount, like 100,000. And every yeah. little town and village, every town and village and city you know had an alternative night so bands could get their little transit van and suddenly get a bit of traction quite quickly so right most bands have the five-year you know they have the five-year narrative you know 12 months getting together single john peel gives it a play the john peel session things going really well first album things going even better second album mm, tricky <laughs> third album yeah let's not bother anymore so that right. was, yeah. so the smiths came along i suppose that was the you know an 87 then they broke up it felt like oh the indie party you know that kind of the bands like yeah yeah no the the um yeah, that was, yeah, yeah, no, the the Mighty Lemon Drops, all those kind of, you know, the June Brides, the Wolfhounds, kind of all giving it a bit of a miss. And also Ecstasy comes along, which is kind of a, this again, you know, very simplistic, isn't it? You know, there, there's that kind of move of kind of dance, you know, the next wave of 16, right. 18 year olds want their music. And it's like, you know, suddenly they want to dance, they want to get off their face. They, the Soup Dragons have suddenly changed into an, you know, a dance band and the Happy Mondays also. Primal yeah, Street, the, yeah that. and the Acid House, James Taylor Quartet, which we loved. Um, and that, that came along and that sort of was suddenly mixed with a bit of shoegazing so you had that north london scene with people like my bloody valentine silverfish the faith healers you know and early years yep. of lush as well so you did you pick up on that kind of the shoegazing kind of world that started to um... absolutely yeah i had a, a friend played me uh strawberry wine by the valentines in you know right after i uh i 
Yeah, like in like 88, I'd say. Right. Um, so, yeah, that was exciting. I had, I had of course, heard Psycho Candy by uh, Jesus and Mary Chain when it came out and loved it for the all the, the reverb abuse, you know. So just sonically, yeah, I was, I was paying attention to all that. And I, you know, I, I did hear the first uh, Lush single when it came out and was completely knocked out by it. So, um yeah, absolutely. I was definitely hip to that. Yes. <laughs> and that's that's how a, a, Los, a band from Los Angeles ends up kind of sounding like that early on. You know, so how did that, how did medicine get together? Uh, it was uh, some recordings that I'd made on four track um, that, you know, where I thought, well, what happens if I just feature the guitars and make them as huge and you know, as I can, and then have like a pop tune under it. I, you know, why, why, you know, why not try something like that? And it kind of worked. And be, due to the fact that nobody else around was doing anything remotely like that, there were hipsters that worked in the music industry there, you know, they pounced on us because we were a novelty. Yes. Um. So, and also because I'm difficult and had you know listen to all this experimental music and prog and all that like we didn't quite get it right so <laughs> which yes. thank god you know well absolutely because we, so, in this country i mean we'd had the the kind of the sonic youth and butthole right. surface and big black and then there's that 4ad moment of yes and the pixies that come along and i remember they were a double bill playing the UK doing 89 and played Glastonbury. And I remember seeing them go, wow, the Pixies, amazing. Throwing right, them and, and throwing muses, you know. I mean, I and I was listening to all that at the time too. You know, yes. All... And then what happened about the suddenly Bleach appeared and, you know, suddenly Tad and Nirvana was sort of touring the UK as well. Right. Did, did you sort of, you know, how was that kind of influence in your sort of sound and, and sort of the it, musical it landscape? It wasn't. I, I found the grunge stuff super boring and retro. Like I didn't, you know, I didn't want to hear bands that sounded like Grand Funk, you know. I, it, of course, now I appreciate Nirvana's genius, but when they were around and playing small clubs, I mean, my kid brother saw them in tiny places a few times, but yeah, I was a little snobby and didn't didn't pay attention too yes. much. Um, but yeah, yeah, the grunge thing was like, I yeah, not inspiring to me personally. I was. Yeah, it's always looking to for more sonic experimentation rather than, you know. Yes. And were you really keen to get a female singer for the band? Yeah, for better or worse. It seemed like that was an, an important thing to have. Yes. And I'd, I'd, and I'd had a history of working with, with female musicians, and I still, to this day, think they're the only ones doing anything interesting at the moment. But um, I can't so remember. Yeah. There was a member of Jefferson Airplane that said he really wanted to sing, you know, have a, he didn't want a band of men. He wanted right. you know, to I balance think it's, it. It's, ni it, it's nice to have the balance of uh, hormones. You know? It is. It keeps it keeps it interesting. Did you? I mean, Creation Records at yeah. this stage. I mean, you know, they'd had that. Alan McGee had sort of gone down from London, from Glasgow to London, set up this small club called the Living Room, and then put out a lot of you know amazing singles with bands who you know yeah. were very much of that kind of indie world. So some yeah. bizarre ones, like Momus, I think as well. Um, right, right. Big and, champion of. Big champion of Momus, yeah, and it was you know a big deal for us to end up on that label. I mean, it's it's still quite astounding to me that we did. Um, yeah, it, it, and it was kind of an interesting time because there was quite a lot of, um, I mean, obviously my you know my bloody Valentine, but there was you know there was quite a few other people recording, so they were they were, yeah, they they were doing some extraordinary stuff, which you know it's like probably no one I can't remember who it was, but I did in, interview someone who said oh. We did an album which we loved doing, but it wouldn't have sold any copies. So, how right. did you? How did Alan find you or discover you? Well, you know, most people assume it was we started there and then got signed in America, but it was actually the other way around. We we signed with Rick Rubin's. It was then called Deaf American. It became American, um, and they felt that for us to be a proper indie band, even though we weren't, we needed to have our first release come out on an actual indie label. So um, our American major label pitched it to Alan McGee and he said, yeah, I'll have that. Right. Uh, 
and he came out here and we met him and it was hilarious and i couldn't understand a single word he said and i uh, don't do well with the scottish accent um but he i remember he played me a saint ntn track and i said oh that sounds like kate bush and he like practically was in tears he, that made him so happy <laughs> like i was like okay uh easily easily pleased fellow here so i mean i i don't know i think it was uh, there was a bit of you know short-lived hysteria over us and you know i think he just snatched us up out of fear for somebody else doing it you know yeah. we nearly went we nearly went with hut which oh, yeah. is a, it's, it was kind of a shame we didn't uh because i think they got us more but yes who was on hut i can't remember who was the verve acetone uh, right yes smashing pumpkins amazing (laughs) but anyway i mean but then you know creation then locked out with sugar so um right which was simultaneous with medicine you know yeah they, they ate our lunch because um because i think uh, <laughs> cuz bob bob's solo album hadn't quite happened had it and then sugar came along it was yeah. like, oh, okay. i i loved his first solo album actually work work workbook yeah workbook, it was all it was all sensitive and acoustic I loved it was it. beautiful there was yeah. there was i think i think there's a sort of an instrumental isn't it the first song was an instrumental which yeah. was which was done so making yes. the first your first album shot forth self living yeah. so what was that um what was the process like getting that together it was just it was very much the traditional recording a rock band doing their set kind of thing um just you know, all of us recording basic tracks and then overdubbing, you know, under, but, you know, I also produced it, you know, it was my first time ever in a 16 track studio and, and, um, you know, high stress, but it, it did what it was supposed to do. And then the other thing that I don't know if a lot of people realize is Jim, our drummer came from the country music scene and, and was, you know, a decade or so older than all of us and knew all of these birds and flying burrito brothers uh, uh, adjacent people. Mm. So he said, Hey, well, why don't I get sneaky Pete to come in and play? And he did, he came in and played on two songs and he fits right in. And it's just, it's so stunning. Yes. <laughs> He's on uh, a short, happy life and a Christmas song on, on shot for self living. Um, and you, and you're I, quite, and you're quite sort of, um, creative you know the long tracks aren't they this yeah is- it, it was uh, intentional commercial suicide <laughs> i was like there are there are 10 million alternative rock bands right now all doing their same thing if we don't do something different and possibly self-destructive then this will just disappear into the ether and i won't have anything to be proud of when I'm 55. <laughs> so I'm <laughs> proud of it now because I did that. And I think it was a, a good move though. It was just absolute, you know, it was yes. commercial suicide. So was, was that the one, was that, was that on America or was that on part of creation as well? Was that, it came t- out, it came out on creation in all of Europe and it was on a uh, deaf American. And did it sell? Uh, no. Never, never sold. I've. I don't think we ever sold much of anything. But but yes. it got it got uh, create. You know, it was a, one of those critical, either acclaim or hatred. We got a lot of just the snotty. Oh, they sound like shoegaze, right? You know, which was just people, you know, displaying their. Uh, did you get a chance to um, tour the UK as well as Europe? Yes, we stage? did. Yes, yes, we did. We right. uh, came over there and uh, we came over there with Smashing Pumpkins first, actually. Um, toured all over UK and Europe with, with them. We did our own headline show, not the garage or the garage, sorry. Uh, it was with Swallow, the 4AD right. band Swallow. And yeah, we had our asses handed to us by the press. We actually just, you know, we released the Aruka 12 inch on creation. It was pretty high up on the indie charts. And then we came over there and just got blown out of the water critically. Like it was like the meanest reviews you could possibly imagine. I got, we had like the, you know, the classic British press 
story, but compressed into like a month, you know, build them up, knock them down like fast, really fast. <laughs> <laughs> so I think they correctly sensed that I was not to be trusted. Yes. You know, I think they saw, you know, something, this isn't proper shoegaze. This is, you know, what is going on here? You know? So, yeah. Yeah. And how did you and how did you sort of then because it's quite an intense experience and then think, right, we can't sort of waste any time. We've got to get back in the studio, write another album, record yeah. it and get it out. What was it like sort of following up with The Buried Life? It was um, it was nerve wracking, but I'm really glad that we did. And I wish that it had continued in that direction because um, The Buried Life, it doesn't care. It just is what it is. And I was experimenting and you know, paying through the nose to have Van Dyke Parks on it. <laughs> um, you know, um, which wasn't a popular decision with my bandmates at the time. But uh, again, I get to say that I'm, Van Dyke Parks is on The Buried Life, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, I, lo- I love that record. I think that's that's the best of the old school, you know, the original medicine lineup. Yes, which it's is always because it's it's because it does all kinds of things on it it's you know but again we're not to be trusted <laughs> we're not we're not shoegaze purists we're not you know you'd never know what we might do and how did you i mean because at this stage you know with bands they have a bit of a shuffle around members leaving and starting mm. you know and and joining the the unit how did that um how did you sort of navigate that was did you feel like you were holding the baton for the band absolutely um, yeah, we had two people leave before that record, uh, who just hated being in somebody else's band and wanted to do their own thing. And we were touring too much and we toured quite a bit. I mean, I never want to tour again because of all that. Yes. Um, you know, we always did it the hard way, always in a van and, you know, crappy conditions and yeah. So, I mean, it probably helped us get around, but yeah. And did I, it, I mean, nightmares when you, about it, so. so when you went into the your third album, Her Highness, mm. did you feel like that was going to be the last recording with the band at that stage? There was a sense that if we didn't do something that could get on the radio, that we would get dropped, which is indeed what happened. And I, I wish, I mean, a lot of people tell me they love that record. I, I have so much negative emotion connected to it um, because it just felt like we were not, doing the original mission of the band which was to be creative and, yes um so it's a very sour sort of bitter <laughs> memory for me um though people assure me it's it's a good record i don't know you know we hired see that's the theme that each record had like a, a an old guy on it i don't know if you know but the the her highness was co-produced by eddie offered yes who, who is the yes producer. I mean, his, he's pictured as a band member on the back of close to the edge for Christ's sake, but, um, and you know, and he worked on imagine by Lennon, but anyway, that was a, a huge mistake bringing him in. Um, you know, Eddie awful. What was his, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, what was, Eddie. What was, what was, <laughs> what was, who, whose idea was that? Mine. Right. And did you think- I, I was like, you know, playing Relayer and going, imagine us sounding like Relayer, man. You know? <laughs> yes. you know, I just thought, you know, I learned the hard way that he wasn't the genius behind Yes. Right. What was it? What was it like when you first met him then? Um, Just me, you know, fawning over him and asking what it was like and, well, you know, Yes fanboy stuff. Yes. You know. <laughs> I still think Heart of the Sunrise is one of the it's, great. Yeah, what's what's better than that? I mean, it's such it's a climactic so... moment at the end. Yeah. yeah, after ten minutes, I mean, it was quite something. And what was the what was the dynamic like with the band? Because at this stage, it was kind of, you know, you, Jim, and Beth, wasn't it? The right. core members. Yeah, Were it was you... not good. It was not good. Um... Right. Jim and I have been friends forever and will be, but we were at odds then and 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 beth and i were always at odds yes it was, odd, it, it was never a, a comfortable fit her and i um you know i i think she sounds great on the records but you know I, if i can be objective at all that i you know i don't think that she sounds bad on the records but no. her and i were her and i were never like 
close friends or you know yes yeah what are you gonna do so when the album you know was finished did you manage to tour it or did you do one of those things like the we, zombies and just went oh that's it let's just not do this no unfortunately we did do one final american tour after her highness and it was pretty rough it was rough going um and i you know i ended up quitting before we even finished it because it was so miserable right blimey right. Yeah, no, it was it was ugly. I mean, that's you know, but it, I guess it's something that had to happen, um, you know. And I met my my wife at that around that time, and we're still together and have a kid, and you know, everything's all nice. So I, you know, it was like a crucible that I had to pass through <laughs> to uh, <laughs> to get to uh, a decent life. Um, yes, my God, that's quite rough, isn't it? it Didn't well, did you? Sure. Did you sort of form this kind of next kind of project, which is with various members of other bands? Oh, Lusk? Yes. Yeah, I was invited to participate in that, which seemed very refreshing at the time. And, you know, I mean, it was guys from Tool, so they had tons of money to play around with. Yes. And, you know, I'm not, not wasn't then and I'm not now a Tool fan, but they kind of came, they were sort of neighbors, strangely enough, like Adam Jones girlfriend and my girlfriend were roommates back in the day. Um, so, you know, Tool were always sort of like fond of medicine and I, you know, we were friendly, socially friendly. Yeah. And so yeah, medicine had just broken up and I get in, invited to do this kind of lovely, you know, well-funded rock star vanity project and, you know, and I brought some songs to it and it ended up being a kind of a, I probably ruined it for them by making the record too creative and interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm terrible that way. Cause now, you know, they've all moved on to be like in guns and roses and ministry and stuff <laughs> like that, you know? Yes. So I'm, you're such, able, so... I'm such a shit talker. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so are you able to sort of just slip you know, Are you a multi-instrumentalist? Yeah, I play all the rock band instruments. All of it. I consider so can... myself to be a bass player primarily. I mean, but keyboards, vocal, drums, guitar. guitars. Yeah, that's it. My God, that's that's amazing. So as yeah. the, as as we trundle through, and we are worried about the millennium bug, what was the last? <laughs> what was the end of the? I know, I can't remember that. Um, what was the end of the nineties like for you? Um, confusing. Uh, sad my dad passed in 2000 um also that year in 2000 i don't know if you heard but like my pal's band the canadian band blinker the star were going to be produced by lindsey buckingham uh in two th in the year 2000 and uh my pal jordan who was living in los angeles at the time from that band uh felt bad for me for what i was going through with my with my dad and invited me to be the bass player on these sessions uh, with Lindsey Buckingham, uh, where he we worked with him for a week. Um, I handed him a CD of songs that Jordan and I had been writing, and one of them popped up on his current solo album. Nice. Last year. Well, it was nice once we got him to admit that he took the song from us. Right. There were the, did he just say, oh, I've had a heart attack and I've had a lot of work, so I, I forgot? Yes. <laughs> And my response was, I've forgotten all the songs I didn't write as well. <laughs> Did but he? Yeah, part, I mean, you know, he's, you know, I, I still love love him and his work. I mean, but yeah, that that was rough last that year. Was, that was a bit cheeky, wasn't it, really, Lindsay? Very cheeky. <laughs> Blimey, Lindsay. Naughty, naughty, cheeky boy. <laughs> yes, he should have known better. You'd have thought at that age. Well, and yeah. it's, and thankfully we didn't have to sue him and we settled and yes. he went, oh, all right. Yes. I know, forgot we had all kinds of documentation and timestamps and photos and, you know, yes. But yeah. when, when did he suddenly go, okay, fair enough. Like immediately. Right. So there you go. That's, that's good. <laughs> yes. So why, so, but doing one of those classic things, we mentioned Lush earlier, the, the yeah. British band, they reformed. That was a disaster right. Um, right. on so many levels and we'll never, ever speak to each other again, I don't think. Oops. 
Um, so medicine, you reform, which is one of those interesting yes. moments. What was what was the reason for that coming together? Well, um, the New York label captured tracks, which is for a while there, I think was almost like a modern day rough trade. I think they were releasing tons of great stuff. And they reached out to me in 2012 and said that they wanted to somehow reissue the first two medicine albums. And I said, great. And they did it. They'd managed to do it. And I was so kind of thrilled with that whole process that I thought I'm working with this cool label what would happen if i tried to make a medicine record and i reached out to jim and beth and they were keen and we did it it made the record had no plans to play live but we released it and all of a sudden people wanted us to do some shows so we did like seven gigs and i didn't particularly enjoy it i don't that gene that or that you know that that need to be on stage has kind of left me i you know i'm a studio rat i love to make studio things i like yes i like to record i like to compose in the studio that's that's what i like about being a musician not standing on stage so we did that but and made a couple of records and that's that and now it 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 survived as a studio thing now which suits me just fine yeah it's so great did, it's great so this, did you have a different singer at this stage did beth stay with the band on the mechanical forces of love no mechanical forces of love is actually from 2003 and that is a one-off that i did with shannon lee bruce lee's daughter yes who I, and who happens to be a classically trained singer um and uh, I met her socially and yeah, and somehow we ended up on the wall of sound label. I mean, I, you know, I've been all over the place. It's so random, but you know, I, we signed to wall of, okay. okay. <laughs> so did you, I, I, well, when you were re reformed in 2003 with Beth, did you record no, an album? That, that, no, that was 2013 with Beth. It was 2003 right. was the one on wall of sound with Shannon Lee. Right. The one-off on, you know. Yes, Mechanical Forces. Right. Yes, that's interesting. So what was it like working with Shannon? It was wonderful. I mean, we were like siblings. We just instantly got, got along, and it was making the record was really lovely. Um, it wasn't meant to be a medicine record. I At the time that I was working on it, there was a... Uh, techno duo out of London calling themselves medicine and releasing stuff on wall of sound. I write a letter to Mark Jones at wall of sound saying, Hey, cut that out. Yes. <laughs> you know, that's our name, you know, and we're, it's not like we're completely unknown in the UK. You can't do that. And he said, well, you know what? Those guys are kind of screwing me over and, and leaving wall of sound for another label. Why don't I put out a record by you called medicine uh, to, and, blah 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 so yeah i said okay fine i thought it was a, a great idea i ended up going over to london and like meeting banksy <laughs> because mark jones was one of his biggest early supporters right and so being you know you know hanging out with roy Ksop and <laughs> stuff like that you know meeting banksy and, and you know like it, just being like what am i doing here you know it just Part of that my weird journey you know that is funny and so had banksy at that stage become a name yeah but only in that only in london right what is that area around portobello road i can't remember what what part of london that is, is that west no. is that west london west or north i think yes ah, in... see i don't know no i don't, I don't want don't. to embarrass myself but but that area their uh, Wallace Sounds offices were all right next to the Portobello Road, right? And so that whole area was covered in early Banksy stuff, yes. Uh, and that's where he was. No, I wasn't impressed, you know, when I met him, he wasn't, you know, Banksy in all capital letters quite yet. No, but I wish I'd appreciated it and stayed in touch, taking a was, selfie, yeah, at least. <laughs> Or taken one of his pictures and said, yeah, I'll take it. Right, or take, you know, had him draw something on a napkin for me or something. And, and said, yeah, I'll keep it. Yeah. And, um, he, is, he is on the cover of a record that Medicine is on, though. Like, actual physical photo of him. There's a Wall of Sound, like, 10th anniversary. Right. LP, and he's on the cover of that. Like, there you go. Making a graffiti. 
as one does. Climbing. So that's your on the wall of sign label. Oh, yeah, that was the, the the story of the 2003 Shannon Lee thing that was Excellent. called medicine, but it was called medicine for just out of spite. <laughs> 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 it's so weird. So it was the 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 one ten years later on captured tracks with Beth and Jim is actually you know A proper properly. One. This properly. is the one which is called to the happy few. To the happy few and home everywhere uh, are the ones we put out, and that and a. There's a because the band the band does have a lovely story, doesn't it? Even though you've had some ups and downs, there's yeah. this kind of the core of you of kind of work yeah. through. Have you kind of had band therapy? Well, we've talked a lot. I mean, Jim, who is I consider to be my dearest friend in the world, like him and I didn't speak for 17 years, and uh, that's you know, so it was very joyful to reconnect with someone who I consider to be like you know my older brother, you know. Yes. And who, you know, yeah, we end every conversation nowadays with, I love you, man. <laughs> we do. I mean, I mean, yes. it's, it so, does happen. Yeah. Um, what, what was the reason for you sort of having a 17 year old, 17 year sort of just, just space? having, just because we sat in a tiny van for three years on the road, getting sick of each other. And, you know, there were personal issues that I won't go into here that, you know, got transcended and fixed. And yes, um, these things happen. Yeah, absolutely. So it, it was really just that. I mean, you can love somebody to death that you go on the road with them and that's just over, you know. <laughs> well, it's We'd interesting. Enough, you know, yeah, because I was going to say most bands, I, I, you know, from this period break out for two reasons. Well, there's probably more than, but, you know, like the five years. But also, often right. it's like we've got no money. And the other thing is for British bands, if they ever go and tour America, they they are in the conversation they often say, and then we came back and broke up, and oh. it's almost like God, it just it just America just kills you, it just finishes. Yeah, you. it's a big difficult place to tour in. It's much easier to tour in Europe. Uh, everything is much closer together. Um, yes, you know, and we so we did three years of one night stands of you know barely getting any sleep, and you know it just it's just a that's a terrible life. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't. I'm glad we did it, but I would never do it again. And I, you know. Did you manage yeah. to keep any memorabilia or a diary? Oh, yeah. Or... I'm such a hoarder. I've got everything. I mean, this every, is great. I've got every every handbill, every t shirt, every poster, every, you know, I've kept diaries. Yeah, forget it. I mean, you know. Yes. So, well, apart <laughs> from, you know, with the band, that's, you know, incredibly intense, but you've done like hundreds of other sessions and recordings yeah. with other people. Yeah. I mean, are you the the ultimate go-to person in LA? No, not at all. Not at all. I just happen to randomly, you know, end up you know, like the the bunk, the Lindsay Buckingham story is classic for me. Like it happens by accident. The same thing with my Brian Eno story. You know, he sampled something by me. And yes. I, one day one day I get an email from him. Hey, is this you? Uh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> you're God, by the way. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, you know, there's that album by him called Another Day on Earth that I'm credited with Pulse Loop because right. he, he sampled something by me and said, do you want a songwriting credit? And I said, no, give me an Eno-esque credit, please. And so I'm, I played Pulse Loop. Excellent. I, I hope he reissues that on vinyl. It's a really good album, actually. Yes, absolutely. Then, you know, so how do you then navigate your life during these kind of periods of, do you just, are, you know, is it kind of hustle? You know, do you have to do a lot no. of hustling? No, it's the opposite. It's the mountain has to come to Muhammad. So there's like long periods of idle, you know, which I take advantage of by developing skills and pursuing my interests learning how to play a modular synth or just get into doing nothing but collecting records i mean i um or you know having a child and doing nothing but concentrate on that for a few years you know my my son was born in 2004 um he's now 18 um so you know i've i'm incredibly fortunate in that I've always just done whatever the hell I want and it works out. Yes. Um, and my, <laughs> nowadays, 
my wife is a label owner and manager of a very popular reggaeton artist named Jay Cortez, who's, you know, currently touring in Spain, but, you know, um, completely different world, but, you know. Fantastic. Yeah. That's, that's, that, that must just be so exciting. So how did you kind of navigate the lockdown period for two years? Did that, did that, was that a kind of productive time for you or did it? Yeah, it was actually. Um, yeah, no, just, you know, stayed at home and played with the synth, released a ton of synth um, wankery on <laughs> Bandcamp. <laughs> <laughs> i'm yes. sorry but that is what it is i mean i just you know learn along with brad on the synth yes uh yeah band camp is filled with i mean I, I think i put out like 50 60 band camp records of just synth experimentation um during that time so as you do so with the uh, new album you've got a new album out for medicine called drugs right. haven't you yeah so was this with was this a project that you had started you know creating during lockdown then came together in a studio no it it came together uh last december jim came over with his drums and said here here's all these great beats record them and do something with them i was like all right and i spent the next five months turning it into a medicine record the first one that's just jim and i yes um and promptly tossed it into the digital void um <laughs> and that was like a month ago i mean and it's you know now we're now i'm talking to you so <laughs> it's yes absolutely i mean if you I could mean, that's one, wonderful to not have to deal with a label or waiting around or hiring pr or anything it's yes just, just the who, music and who also features on it just him and i and uh uh my pal Matt Devine, who uh, played quite a bit on our last LP, which yeah, called "Scarred for Life," which was all covers, has a Squiddy Polity cover on it. In fact, uh, speaking of C eighty one, we do "Sweetest Girl" by Squiddy Polity on it. Um, nice. Um, so he plays on the Beatles cover on our on our new album. Blimey, me, that's seems- right, that's we do a- uh, you know did a do a heavy version of "Long Long Long" on the new album. God. Uh- that's 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 quite something i mean if you could have said something to your 16 18 year old self starting out is there anything you would have just wanted to whisper to them to say look this is this is a good thing to focus on or yeah i would would love to encourage that my 16 to 18 year old self um i would just say yeah you're on the right path keep going (laughs) i i mean i'm really you know does that is that ridiculous i don't know I mean, no, I, it's, I, it's think absolutely... I, I think I, I think I was so bloody minded and headstrong that I didn't need that. Yes, I was also on acid a lot at that age. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. I think it sometimes helps, doesn't it? Having a period of um, psychedelics can absolutely, absolutely. I haven't touched it since then, but um, it kind of totally informed everything. I mean. As, as, as we're sort of looking forward to the, this incredibly bizarre decade, I mean, what's your plan for the next 12 months? I mean, Oof. either musically or, or creatively. I, I fully intend to start with Jim on the next, on another album as soon as possible. He's, he's uh, currently at home devising all of the extremely difficult beats he's going to give me. Right. And I, you know, I have a home studio. I'm sitting in it now. Uh, that's so does a lot of people in LA have home studios by the way yes because I was just thinking I did an interview with a member who was in Jellyfish and he said oh look at this my like I've just moved here this is my new studio it's like oh, wow was that Roger Roger Manning or I don't know but he was a you know one of those multi-instrumentalists as right. well who, who just seemed to sort of had lots of music and lots of sort of projects going and yeah. was going, oh, yes, I've got to record some parts for the next Sinead O'Connor album. And I played bass. I don't know what. Yeah, it sounds like Roger Manning. But um, yeah, no, I mean, and I know lots of people like that who are much better at getting gigs than I am, because, like I said, I wait for stuff to come to me. So, yeah. Um, are, you, are you finding with the with with sort of the passing of time, people have become more interested in, in the band now? Yes, than they... yes absolutely. It's, it's always um, the way, isn't it? It seems that way. I think um, medicine made a one particular move that has caused us to have longevity and to have and that is appearing in the crow 
right film the crow and being on the soundtrack album which sold three million copies you know when it came out it was triple platinum i was able to give my dad my platinum award and say see i told you i could make money doing this um so that has uh kept us uh um relevant i guess in the in the streaming age in the streaming and that, and that's part and that's part of what gave me the the nerve to just throw this this recent record we did out directly to those people because all of a sudden we have tens of thousands of followers and listeners on spotify the evil spotify um so i don't make a penny but it's also a direct line to people's ears yes. which is what i care about more um i'm fortunate enough to be in the position to care about that more than remuneration um so yeah no that's a that's a that's a thing you know with with that release on the on um the crow soundtrack which is is it time baby i time baby three time baby three (laughs) did that did that feature liz fraser on those it did uh it was another long story I mentioned that Van Dyke Parks was on our second album yes. doing arrangements. We had him arrange two songs, one of which Live It Down made the album, and we had him do an arrangement of Time Baby as well, which didn't make it. I've since released it as Time Baby VDP. It's mm. on it's on the streaming services. It's lovely. I love it. But we at the time we took the basic track and took Van Dyke Park stuff off and our a and r guy mark geiger at american who is friends with robin guthrie said let me send this to him robin guthrie was keen to re- produce a whole album by us and i was not keen to have him produce a whole album by us for a variety of reasons um but this track got sent to him and he was going to remix it we get the remix back and it's got liz fraser singing all over it too and obviously we weren't mad about that. <laughs> <laughs> so there it is. I mean, gift from the heavens, you know. <laughs> have you have you sort of have you said have you made peace with it now? Oh, I love the track. I mean, what well, I mean, there's no no, I mean it's great. It's the best thing, I mean, professionally, probably the one of the best things that's ever happened to me, you know. Yes. But, <laughs> having that having that happen. It's okay. Being, it's- yeah, it's a it's a strange thing. Yes. You, you know, if you see the if you see the film, we're actually playing the original that came out on creation on the the five single. Um, yes. At, but then they heard the version with the Cocteau Twins, the people who made the film, and said, "You know, can we have that?" You know, I think it was a a deal where they we were allowed to make a video using footage from the Crow if we would let them have the Cocteau version of the song for their soundtrack. Yeah, yes. that'd be fine. Yeah. It worked out. It worked out. But that's just been amazing. Yeah. And look, I need <laughs> to check out your your partner's ba- your partner's um uh, did you say what was his name? God, I should know this Jim, Jim Goodall. I mean No, the the guy that she's kind of uh, managing, you said this Oh, reggae. I'm sorry. Uh that's a, a J it's spelled J H A Y. They always do, don't they? Yeah, Cortez. He's an associate of Bad Bunny, you know, who is Beatlesque in his hugeness at the moment. Um, it's it's Puerto Rican uh, reggaeton. You know, it's Puerto Rican music. Yeah, my wife. My wife is Puerto Rican. Um, She's got so her finger on the pile. The, the, the she the does. Guys. She does. It's good to have um, someone on the side, guys. For sure. I always say, you know. She's on the right side of the desk of, uh, <laughs> for for the music industry. Yes, you know. <laughs> handy, handy. Yeah. Well, Indeed, brilliant. Well, look, thank you ever so much for giving me the time for this. It's been amazing. And if you want, I can always give you the link, and then you can. Yes, um, please. You I can will share it around for sure. Just share it with all your friends. Yes, but I will this... share it willy nilly, and you know. And also, is it easy to find the your your material on Bandcamp? You should be absolutely. Sure. It's just you know, but it's under my name. It's under Brad Laner, not Medicine. So there, there's all kinds of Medicine goodies on my page. So it's nice. just Bandcamp, Bandcamp slash Brad Laner, all one word. It's you know, couldn't be easier. 
No, absolutely. And if you get a chance, just my top tip, go and see. I think you can stream it from probably something like Amazon, you know, the the King Rocker film about the Nightingales and Robert Robert Lloyd. I will watch and learn because I know absolutely nothing about but you'll artists. love it and and you'll also discover the comedian Stuart lee and there's a little bit with the yes. minds of danny I'm Fields. familiar i'm familiar with him so um it's yeah. it's worth it we love our because what i've noticed in the last few years is that i think when people have had experiences in bands 30 years ago they often go right that's it i'm never thinking about it again and then right. decades decades pass and then there's a little bit of kind of mm, perhaps i'll have a Look at look look at it again. Have a think about it. You know, make peace with it. But there's been a lot of films and books and documentaries coming out from that period of the '80s, which, you know, is pretty niche. I mean, there was a film on the night, not the Nightingales, the Wedding Present film. You know, um, oh, wow. on George Best, the film. You know, and then there right. was like ones on the Chills and the Triffids and the Go Betweens and the Slits and you know the Dolly mixtures. So I think. Right. It, it well, is, the, slits are, the slits are like towering over all that for me. But, you know, you know <laughs> like I said, I'm more of a C81 guy. So, yes. Know. Well, the slits and um, even the Go Go's got a film out recently. And I think that's the right. Chick, so it's kind of, you, you realize that suddenly people are going back and finding some. There's not a huge amount of footage, but there's enough to make a film and people sure. are enjoying it. So, um, all right. That Big Star film had virtually no footage in it and it was still pretty good. Yes, and there was what was the, oh Danny Danny, the one about Danny yeah, Fields, says, yeah. and um, there was lots of there drawings. Was that, the, yeah, there was that Velvet Underground one recently also, which was mostly yes just art, just artfully placed text and things. You know, that was beautiful. I yeah. love that film. Yeah, it was great. I know we were that generation. We just want to watch films about music bands and the yeah, Beatles. I'm pretty pretty voracious appetite for that. Mm. I just wish they'd made a film of Exile on Main Street. You know, that would have been so interesting. Right. To have a camera down there. In the, in the, <laughs> in the basement. basement. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Never mind. I'm sure there's yeah. not. But anyway, look, thank you ever so much. I'll let you groove on. But um, right. yes, I'll keep in touch. And, but and again, thank you, thank you as well. And yeah, please do. I will. Okay. Take care. Enjoy take the care. sunshine. Yes, I'm I going shall. To bed. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. And that, dear listener, is the end of the interview, just in case you weren't sure. I know, I love leaving that last bit in. It keeps me amused and smiles, makes me smile. Anyway, look, massive thank you to Brad from Medicine, talking about his life, your music, and much more. This has been the C86 Show. I'm David Eastall. If you want to contact me for some groovy and nice reason, you can on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Just do C86 Show, you will find it. And also, all these interviews have been archived. Aren't you lucky? You can find those on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, just do C86 Show. And with that, dear listener, we say goodbye. Have a great week. Stay safe.